If you have any questions, feel free to ask me, okay? Um, these are the visit rules, okay? And it tells them how to dress, tells them, you know, what is acceptable. I'll tell you now, just tell them to come dress modest, where nothing is showing, no sheer clothing, not, nothing too tight, because they will send them out. They will not let them visit, okay? Try to cover, you know, as much as possible. <clears throat> um, it tells you on here what's acceptable, okay? And um, they're not allowed to bring in money or anything. They can bring in like $20 worth of change so that you guys can get something from the canteen, canteen okay. machines. Um, try to eliminate all the jewelry, earrings, everything, okay? And uh, try to try to ask them if they can, try to, not to wear things with metal, you know? If they have um, medical devices on them that they have to wear um, <clears throat> that have metal, it would be best that they tell us when they fit, send their visit form in, give us that information, and we can put that in your packet and have have that on file, okay? Um, if they come in and they need a wheelchair or something, make sure that they let the officer know at the visiting, because we, we want to try to accommodate them. We don't want them walking out here and having an injury or something. Um, I don't know. Is there, I don't know. Is there, is there anything you want to ask me? Because as far as I know, I mean, there might come up some. You might come up with some questions that you're not thinking of right now. Ask me anytime, okay? And this is the updated pamphlet for sexual assault, the one that I gave you earlier. <clears throat> These are medical forms. If you feel sick or something happens and you need to see medical, you need to complete this form, okay? okay? Let the officer know that you need to see medical and they'll put you on the medical list. When you go to medical, you need to take this form with you, okay? If you don't want to carry the form, you can drop it in the medical boxes out there, but they have to have a copy of this. Okay. And you need to tell them what you need to see them for, okay? <clears throat> Just give, you know, say, state whatever the reason is, yeah, and, and then you have to out. sign it, okay? But make sure that you have this with you when you out, go out to see them. Okay. And that's even if you need to see uh, the dentist right. or whatever. If you need to have glasses, you need to see the eye doctor, you have to put it on the medical form, right. okay? okay? And I think, unless you have some more questions, no, that covers it all. When you send out those uh, visit forms, you can send out 12, but you can only put seven in an envelope and not have to pay additional postage, okay? Okay. All right. So that's it. Have any problems, let me know. If I could just have you know, talk to them through. Have you been here? What's I've only been here for a week or so now. A week. So, um, hang on. Can you just wait until it quiets down for a minute. <laughs> Is there any way you guys can reach in? All of us get in here? Can you shut that door? Because yeah. otherwise, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. There's a small office in here. So. Or come a little closer to the You come over here. Okay. First of all, if you could just give us your, um, you know, say my name is Adam, I'm however old you are. My name is Adam Futura, 17 years old. 17 years old. Whoops. Sorry. I got wires running out everywhere. So you're new to Wabash. Tell me what that was like, that feeling the day you were first brought here. The feeling was kind of strange. I didn't really know anybody. 
till I met a, seen a couple of my friends here, but this isn't the place where nobody wants to be. But you gotta deal with it when it comes your way. Was it literally scary when you first drove up? I mean, I take it you, paint the picture for me. Were you in a van? What was it? Well, I was in a van, a little van, and you couldn't really see out there unless you stood up. And when I stood up, yeah, it was just like, wow. You know, compared to society to here, this isn't the place where nobody wants to be at all. Did you ever think you'd end up in a place like this? As a juvenile, I had, you know, mistakes here and there, but never would I thought I'd end up in a men's penitentiary, no. Especially living 10 years here now. So what did the judge sentence you to? Can you tell me about your sentence? The judge sentenced me to 30 years, execute 20, suspend 10, do 10. Have to do 10 years in the penitentiary, 10 years on papers um, for a robbery burglary. My attempted murder was dropped. Um, yeah, it's just... Do you remember that day in court? Did it sink in? It was. It was. Seemed like a scary movie. Seemed like it seemed like all a movie for a little bit. You know, honestly, I thought it was a joke from the time I got went and got locked up, incarcerated. It seemed like a joke ever since the day it was sentencing. The day it was sentencing, it was just mind blowing because I mean, it felt like my life just changed in 30 minutes. You know, from the mentality of being to the society, and then changing your mind here to penitentiary for 10 years behind bars. And I hurt a lot of people. So, I mean, now it's just the time for me to sit back and understand life and realize what it's worth. So you're 17. Correct. And you're going to spend at least 10 years? 10 years behind bars. So tw you're looking at age 27. 27, 28. So when you were first waived to adult court, right? what did you think um, when they said we're waving you to adult court. what Can you remember back then what was going through your mind? Yeah, uh, Bond. Thought, you know, because I always heard a lot of grown-ups, oh, they're going to get bonded out. Well, me, I had a revoked bond. Well, somewhat a revoked bond, but I know my mom wasn't going to pay 50000 for me to get out. You know, and it was just ridiculously high. It was way different. You know, I was used to six months to a year in boys' school from them passing out a clock to me, really. You know, 20, 30 years. It just changed my whole life, you know, and I got a lot to go through still. Got a lot of stages to go through. But kind of mind blown when I, when I heard it in court. So many of the kids that we filmed over the years, and we've been filming about 13 years, a lot of them actually sometimes say they prefer to go to the adult, they want to be waived because they think they're going to bond out. So when right. you bring that up, it's really interesting for right. me to hear because I sit with kids in detention and they're like, I hope I get waived because I'll get out faster. Right, no, no, I've experienced it. No, it won't happen. You you shouldn't even want to get, you shouldn't even be in the system in the first place. I started out when I was 12. Yeah, disobedience, school, school, you know, um, Runaways. It just it ended up to this. The long run, it ended up to this, and this is, nobody wants this at all, for their child or for themselves. So now that you've gone through your intake today, now you'll go over to the youth unit, correct? Right, right. Okay, so tell me about going over to the youth unit. Youth unit. I'm not gonna say it's all right, cause it's not. It's um. Twenty hour lockdown, something like that. 17, 20 hour lockdown in a cell, you know, you and a roommate, uh, just hope you have a TV or something, somebody you can communicate with. If not, then all it is is a mind game, really, but there's nothing really there for you. You can't see family, you can't do none of that. Okay. Okay, you ready to go back?
You already won. Talk to us a little bit about the fear factor involved 
in walking into a prison like that for the first time, especially if you're a kid? Yeah, um, when we were talking earlier, I gave you the example when I was 21 years old walking in to be a correctional officer for the first time in the Missouri State Penitentiary. I was petrified, and I was just going in there to work. Um, so obviously, you know, the, the natural reaction, human nature is, particularly for a kid who's going into an environment like that, a brutal environment in some cases, um, you just you, they just simply have to be scared to death. And I think it, at some point, you know, your, your survival mechanisms kick in and, you know, they, they learn to adapt and to, to do they best, the best they can. And they learn, they, they learn survival skills, you know, what it takes to survive in an environment like that. And it's not a positive learning environment either. So it's, it's got to be the, it's got, it, without question, it's got to be the most scariest thing that they've ever gone through. What, what are the survival skills? What? What do, what do people have to come to grips with when they're going to be serving, um, you know, a pretty lengthy sentence behind bars? Um, well, I think uh, first and foremost, they have to come to grips with, you know, the, the inmate code, so to speak. You know, there are certain things that um, we as um, correctional facility administrators and staff require and expect from the population, but at the same time, there's also a code that the population expects of the, the other inmates and offenders that, you know, if you, even if that crosses the line, boundary lines, uh, crosses the rules against what the staff expectations are, if it's a code that the offender population thinks you need to abide by, you know, for your own safety, you pretty much have to stay, you have to go with the code for the offender code. And, and so, you know, that, and that sometimes presents its own challenges because then, you know, you, you break the rules or you've done certain things against the administration and then you have a price to pay for that as well. Um, but obviously, the, you could pay a, a more severe price if you break the, the offender code. I remember when one of the kids we were following who was transitioning out of the youth unit into um, general population at Wabash, one of the correctional officers as he was leaving said, just remember, the word you need to remember most is no, no. Um, and the kid wasn't exactly sure what she meant, but the further we got into our walk over to his unit, um, it started to dawn on him that I really probably shouldn't trust anyone. If somebody offers me something now that I'm in the adult population, I should say no. And he was asking questions about whether or not, is that what she meant? Um, and I wonder how the adult offenders feel when they see a kid walking into their unit. Do you have any idea? Have you ever kind of watched that transition? I have, and it's, uh, it has its own unique dynamic to it, obviously. I think that there are probably some adult offenders who sincerely want to try to do the right thing and, and help uh, help with that transition. Yet there's a lot of predators out there as well who will eat the weakness up. You know, if you if you have a 18 year old or 19 year old not walking into that type of environment for the first time, transitioning, particularly ones that are known to be transitioning out of the youthful offender program, and they're well known. I mean, the adult population knows who they are, and they know when they get there. Um, obviously, that makes that um, that youth very susceptible uh, to some of the, the games and the, um, the, th the different things that the population tries to pull on them in order to get them to do certain things. And they can clearly, you know, if you react to those situations in the wrong way, if you don't use no, um, you can they can get into trouble very quickly. Serious trouble. I mean, life endangering type of trouble. And the kids um, have in their own mind, um, they've conjured up all sorts of scenarios about what it's really like living side by side with adult offenders. But ultimately, is there anything that can prepare anybody for life inside prison? Um, I don't think so. Um, I think really it's. Uh, yeah, you have to be there and you have to adapt to the environment that you're in. And I think you learn the skills that it takes, to, those survival skills, just by being there. Um, I think that it's important that we have programs in place that do the best that we can to help prepare those youth for that transition. Um, 
and in some cases I think we do a pretty good job on that and I think in others we're learning just as much as the other you know as much as the students and the vendors are in some cases there are things that we need to do better and uh, we're dedicated to that process and the more we can help them adapt and help them with that transition the more successful they'll be on the other side what would you want um, you know people in the legal community and also judges to know um, you know anything in particular as they're weighing their decisions on the bench on should we waive or shouldn't we waive and should we commit um, to an adult prison or should we look for um, you know alternative programs when it comes to kids in the system is there anything in particular you want the public or the, the legal community to know well, obviously it's difficult complex uh, incredibly complex issue and there is no easy answer and i think the important thing is that that you have to remain focused on, you know, uh, there is a child involved, regardless of the offense that they may have committed. I mean, you still have to weigh the fact that, you know, this is a, still a 12, 13, 14 year old child, and they are not fully developed. And I think that that has to be taken into consideration and weighed. You also have to weigh, you know, I, I completely agree. You have to weigh that against, you know, the nature of the crime that was committed. And uh, you know, it, it's just it becomes very difficult. But I think in the end, you know, as a society, we we have to. I think we have to have a system in place that allows um, for a, a dual jurisdiction uh, types of sentences, so that in those extreme cases, even though the child's been waived to adult, uh, sentenced as an adult, uh, the judge can still has some authority to invoke a juvenile sentence or we had the Department of Corrections, in our case at least, has the option to still place that, um, that, that youth, that offender, in a juvenile facility until they can at least reach uh, a level of maturity that gives them the ability to at least have a chance of survival in that type of extreme atmosphere in an adult prison. Final question. Um, after all the years of doing this kind of work, do you believe in redemption and hope for these kids, or have you seen it? I absolutely do. Um, the, You'd the, have to say, say like, I believe in redemption and hope. I, <laughs> I believe in redemption and hope. Um, honestly, I do believe in redemption and hope. Um, the sad fact is that a lot of these kids, um, they see no hope in themselves. Uh, so the challenge for the staff is to, uh, to find a way to reach that child in a way that they can uh, invoke that hope. So that because without the hope, you're not going to get the redemption piece either. Um, so just by a child or a student realizing that they don't have to be destined to this type of lifestyle or be destined to adult, adult prison, which is what a lot of them think. They think, you know, my, um, I, have, I have relatives that are across the street in the adult prison, and, you know, that's where I'm destined to go. That's my fate. You know, they truly believe that. You can, when you talk to them, you see it in their eyes. They literally, truly believe that that is their, their fate, is to go across the street to an adult prison. So somehow you have to get through and break that down and give them, make them realize that there is hope. And once they start to see the hope, is, that they have that hope, then everything, you, you see everything start to change. Everything starts to change. Their attitudes, you know, how they go about their, their days, the way that they treat and respect one another, and the way they treat and respect the staff. They start to focus on their education and vocational programs, and they start to do the right things that it takes to turn their life around. Um, they don't have that until they recognize that they, they do have some hope.